Hello! Welcome to Levels Plus Weekly, episode 55. We've finally crossed the threshold. We've done over a year of episodes. That's really impressive to think about. Um, this is the beginning of Hype Month, where I'm going to be getting all excited about games coming out at the end of June, as well as Not E3. <laughs> Um, we've already had a little taste of not E3, courtesy of the state of play that happened on Thursday, which the reaction is up, and I'll put a link to it in the description if you missed it. But this episode, I'll be talking about Fire Emblem Three Hopes, and I think what I want to do to kind of generate some hype is I want to talk about Fire Emblem a little bit. Um, I want to talk about how much I love the Three Houses cast, and I think we'll do a tier ranking. And then I also want to talk about the three trailers that Nintendo's released um, for the game, highlighting all of the houses. So that will be our main course for this episode. But I do have some pickups that we will go over first, right after this quick message from... So, Bitmap Books sent me two books that are like this, in terms of the size. Um, it is the ultimate guide to Japanese role-playing games that uh, Kurt Kalata of uh, Parker Gaming 101 led production on. And I've looked through the PDF that also came with this book. It is marvelous. This is Femtendo research material for me on top of just being a gorgeous uh, book. And I love Japanese role-playing games. So this was almost a given once I found out that it was being made and who was, who was working on it. I am really stoked to actually have this physically now. So that's one of two books that I got. Uh, this other one, though, this other one is a bit, uh, a bit specialized, and if you know your fighting games, and you recognize the SK on the bottom, you might have some idea of what this is. Um, gorgeous art for the cover, though. I mean, just look at how amazing that is. Um, I've actually covered this artist on Levels Plus a few times as my favorite fan artist of the year. And here she is doing incredible stuff. But this is a fantastic book that just dives into so much history. Um, here's the Black Onyx, for example. Um, really well laid out. The font's a tad on the small side. But I already looked through the PDF because if you know me, as I said at the, at the start, this I bought for Femtendo, first and foremost. And it doesn't disappoint. There's a lot of series-based stuff in here. So all the Dragon Quest games, all the Final Fantasies, all of the Megami Tensei games. Um, but towards the end of the book, it starts getting a little bit more broken down into the more unique stuff. So like Hoshi no Mirohito, um, Esper Dream 1 and 2, The Grange Point, There's games in here that I didn't even know I needed to be covering, <laughs> that I needed to go find. I'm just trying to look through, like, Cleopatra no Maho, which is one that I uh, will be covering in 1987. It's in here, Magic of Scheherazade, which I'm covering. Um, Legend of the Ghost Lion. There's, like, it's not every single Japanese RPG on the Famicom, but it is an awful lot of them, and it's got, in most cases, at least a half page devoted to it, if not more. And that's really exciting, and it's, like, just knowing that Hardcore Gaming 101 was involved just makes, makes me know for a fact, as a published author there myself, that um, there is quality. To, uh, to this production. This deluxe edition comes with some bonuses. So it has this 
super huge <laughs> King of Fighters invitation from Rugal himself. Um, and there's some stuff inside there which I'll open up in a moment. I also got this really cool postcard with some exclusive art. But this is the ultimate book here. This is the King of Fighters All-Star Edition, The Ultimate History. So I'm going to get all of the plastic and stuff off of here, and then we're going to look at all the cool bonus stuff after about, <laughs> what, about like 10 minutes of getting a whole bunch of plastic off. We'll start with the slipcase. So the slipcase is special and unique to this edition. It has this little switch here. I turned it on. It activates a speaker. So if I push in one of these buttons, hopefully you heard that. I'll put it a little bit closer to the mic. There you go. Um, and each of them has one. Now it's interesting that Shingo, <laughs> of all KOF characters, ended up on here, but um, just kind of a cool little thing to, to just add a little bit of coolness to the overall package. Um, so let's get into the bonus stuff inside the envelope, which I need to figure out how to open. Wow, they, they literally actually sealed it. <laughs> this is a legit seal here. So the envelope contains some bonus artwork from the series. So this is the iconic 94 poster. Now this is from 96. Favorites from 97. And then another one from 97, spotlighting Shingo and Team Maruchi. So, super cool, high quality prints, along with the postcard. The book itself is thick. I also looked through the PDF of this, waiting for it to arrive. And, uh, I'm not going to show off too much of it because I'm sure Bitmap would prefer if I didn't do that. But just exquisitely printed sprite work and artwork, screenshots, um, concept artwork for the characters. So here's Joe's page, for example. And interviews with the staff on all of the games. I don't know how much it gets into 15. If I remember right, when I was flipping through it, 15 had, was still in development, so it didn't like get too deep into the trenches on that. But super, super high production book. Probably one of the nicest art books that I have ever purchased um, for a specific series. Um, now I'm pretty tempted to buy just the general um, History of Neo Geo book from them to round out the set. So, these books are awesome. I'm very excited to add them to my uh, nice little bookshelf here. And uh, as you might have noticed, to, to conclude this section, I moved my desk. So I am now sitting in front of the hutches behind me instead of having it set up with the desk like this. The monitors are actually facing here now. And I think it's just it's a more comfy film shoot space. Um, got the microphone kind of off to the side and it seems to be picking me up all right. So uh, I think this will be how we, how we do moving forward. But uh, the sun is starting to go down and I am starting to lose any semblance of sunlight on my person. <laughs> so I think we will uh, stop here for pickups and recording on this part of the show, and we'll pick up the Fire Emblem part afterwards. So one more cat intermission for you, and we'll be back. Well, let's, um, let's, let's get into the Fire Emblem portion of the show. So 
I wrote an article recently about the Three Hopes looks versus the Three Houses post-skip looks, which I broke down here. So if you want to check it out, feel free to head over to Levels Plus. But we're going to use my very easily accessible video <laughs> to, to quickly just go through the three videos because we did not do that. I did not record reactions to any of these. And um, I thought it would be fun to to actually do proper reactions for the three houses in Three Hopes. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with Blue Lions. My least favorite house overall, but um, there are some really good looks here. Um, this is the thing I do want to say, instead of focusing so much on how the characters look and all that, is that they did the thing I hoped that they would do. <laughs> My biggest concern with Three Hopes when it was announced was that the roster was going to be very samey. That was the biggest problem with Fire Emblem Warriors, was that too many characters controlled the same. And coming off of Hyrule Warriors, where everybody controlled with a unique move set, it was disappointing to see that Krom and Lucina were effectively the same, that um, the Pegasus Knights were effectively the same. Um, it just it kind of made things less interesting. Um, Age of Calamity did remedy that to some extent, and it looks like with Three Hopes, with the much bigger roster than Age of Calamity had, it's, it's definitely rivaling um, Fire Emblem Warriors, that the, everybody's kind of unique. And um, that is something that makes me extremely happy to see, because that was honestly the one thing that I was most concerned about with Three Hopes. So seeing like characters doing different things with the same weapon. So like Ash and Ignox are both archers, but they do different things with bows. Hubert and Lysanthia both use dark magic, but they do things differently. Um, so I'm just glad to see a lot more customization with everybody's movesets. Same with Bernie. Like Bernie is another archer, but she does her own thing. Um, it's really good to see that focus here, that nobody doesn't seem to be immediately the same. Bobby says hi. Um, the gameplay looks great. Everybody looks like they're pretty fun, which is quite the thing. There's Petra. Petra looks like Lynn. <laughs> Which, if, if you're going to make me happy, you make my favorite character play like I'm close to my favorite character in the outfit Fire Emblem Warriors. Um, yeah, every, the game just looks good. And I'm so excited about the prospect of being able to have everybody be unique. So that way, playing through all these different routes will end up being a whole bunch of fun. That is really what I wanted out of Three Hopes, and it looks like we're getting it. Um, one thing I will say is that Ash and Wolves have not shown up. There was no trailer this week following the three in a row. I bet they're DLC, much like they were in the core game, and I suspect that the church route and the, the, the teachers and security, for lack of a better word right now, will all be DLC characters. But there's some characters that we know that are possible playables that we haven't seen in these trailers. Monica is a really good example. Um, she appears on the map in one of the screenshots that came out a while ago as a unit, but is she playable or not? And that's a question. Um, these trailers also don't really focus on Shez at all or Byleth's relationship to the characters. We just kind of know that Chez is your is your protag, and Byleth has been cast as a rival. 
but I know for a fact, because I've played enough of these games, that Byleth will not be in the game and not be playable. That would be ridiculous. So, I'm just really excited about Three Hopes. I love these characters. I love the opportunity to play with them again um, and do something different. I actually applaud Koei Tecmo for trying something different with this game and not just making it, well, you're still Byleth. Um, and we, we got a, some different stories. I think that this is actually a, a good, unique, alternative timeline type of situation. And you kind of have to work to figure out how to get Byleth on your side instead of her um, just following what happened in Three Houses. Three Hopes is probably the game I'm, I, I have the most personal investment in, in terms of um, connection. Because Three Houses is my fourth favorite game of all time. I adore Three Houses cast. I think that they were incredible, and, and despite me not liking a few of them, on the whole, they're the greatest cast in any role-playing game that I've come across in terms of voice acting, character design, and narratives, and personalities. They just nailed it with these characters. And to be, have the opportunity to explore some different perspective with them just really has me hype. Um, it's not the game that I am personally most hyped for, because um, the game I'm most hyped for is actually like my most anticipated game of the year which is Pocky and Rocky Reshrined, which we'll be covering next week. But in terms of, like, my ex... I, I don't like use... I don't like having expectations, but in this case, my... My hope... Haha. <laughs> is that this will continue the good work that was laid by three houses. So, with that, let's switch over to Tier List. So, here we are, my personal ranking of the Three Houses cast, and I'm going to go through each one somewhat succinctly to try to explain why they are where they're at. So let's start at the bottom and work our way to the top. Linhart. Linhart is probably the one character that I feel the most regret putting at the very bottom. <laughs> but I just don't really like his personality. Um, I think that he is just kind of a gigantic jerk and kind of smug. And I just don't care to interact with him all that much. Dimitri being at the bottom is probably going to get me some heat from certain circles of the internet in the fan base, but I've never liked Dimitri. I don't really care for him. Um, and seeing where his story goes, although I've not played it, basically reaffirmed that for me. I don't like the way that his character basically gets forgiven for the atrocities he commits in the other stories. Felix is kind of similar to Linhart, where I just feel like he's a gigantic jerk and I don't like interacting with him. Um, and in Felix's case, it's more it's it's more standoffish and overconfident, and that those are just traits that I don't really care for. Sylvain's so down here because he's uh, he's a f boy <laughs> who is my least favorite archetype in anime based video games i absolutely abhor men are basically defined by i want to have sex with every woman i ever look at that's sylvain he has interesting components of his characterization outside of that primary thread but he is so much about trying to flirt and trying to win over women and basically lie about everything to try to, to get a kiss or beyond 
that it drives me up the wall having to interact with him whatsoever. He's the one character I never recruit. <laughs> That's how much I dislike Sylvain. If I could put another tier of, of worst, Sylvain would be the character in it. Ignatz, I just don't like his visual design. I, I, I think he looks weird. I don't like his haircut. I don't like his clothes. I don't like his time skip look at all. He's just not a character that appeals to me aesthetically. Um, which is unfortunate for him. Lorenz is kind of like a combination of attributes of Sylvain and Lindhart with a nobility slider put up to 11 for maximum snobbery. And therefore, if I would to put a second character in the bottom, <laughs> in a separate tier of worst, Lorenz would also be with Sylvain. As would Gilbert. Gilbert is a character I don't even fully understand why he's in this game. Um, he's he's a knight, but his relationship with his daughter Annette is is one of the absolute worst father daughter relationships in any video game, and that's saying a lot because many video games have atrocious father daughter relationships. But this one's really, really bad. Like, they're both in the same monastery, and yet he refuses to talk to her. And disappears when she's looking for him. It's it's bizarre. It's, it's atrocious. Gilbert is garbage. And I hate him. And I, I, I think next time I play Three Houses, I will not recruit him. If I can avoid it. Cyril... Cyril is a Rhea fanboy to the point of obnoxiousness. When there already is a Rhea fangirl in Catherine, it just seems redundant to have another character basically be that, but even worse. And with Cyril's case, it's kind of like he's her slave of sorts. It's like he does all of her chores and she just ignores him. It's just really bad. Um, the fact that he's also one of the few characters of color in this game adds to the whole ick factor to me. So I just don't like Cyril. Um, and then there's Yuritsa. Yuritsa is extra. He's a DLC character. He's the Black Knight. Yeah, I'm getting into spoilers here. I'm sorry. Or the Death Knight. Death Knight. Black Knight's Path of Radiance. Death Knight is three houses. <laughs> How many knights in black armor do we need? Um, he is aloof, he is boorish, he is also a sociopath. <laughs> and the worst part is that he's connected with Mercedes, um, they're, they're siblings, and that just adds a lot of weirdness to Mercedes' character that I don't really like. So, Nerissa, you're also a character I think that fails. And the competent range, these are characters that I'm okay with. I don't love them. I don't hate them. I think they're fine. Um, Kaspar is kind of annoying. Um, he, he acts before he thinks. And he doesn't even like to think about after that, after he acts. So he's, he's just a very much in the moment type of person. And... It, it just gets annoying having to see that over and over and over again, and he never learns. Ferdinand von Eyer um, became a meme, and that's basically why he's incompetent. I He's kind of in the same boat as Lorenz for me in terms of having that noble um, personality that he looks down on others that really, really makes him pre-time skip grading to deal with. The nice thing about Ferd is that by the time the post-skip happens, he has some good character development, and he realizes his faults of being so competitive with Idleguard and being so entrenched in the nobility code that he's, he's blinded himself. I think that that's why he's competent, is because he actually has some really good character growth that I like. There's Ash. He's fine. 
I don't have a whole lot of comments on Ash, honestly. He's he's a perfectly okay young man <laughs> who has a very traumatic backstory, and um, I just don't really use him, so I don't really have anything to say about him. Ingrid, Ingrid is one of the more interesting characters in Three Houses in that she kind of becomes the character that has racist tendencies at the beginning and in some of her supports and overcomes that in the time skip, which is why she's not in the bottom. Um, she's, she makes efforts to look beyond her upbringing, looking beyond her family, looking beyond her nobility and realizing that she has been racist and is and starts to make changes about that and so that's good that she has that character growth um i also think in terms of time skip outfits she's got one of the best i love her colors but in terms of her personality she loves food and she uh, doesn't want to get wed to some rando noble i, I think she's she's competent in that case Raphael loves food and working out, and that's basically what he is. I don't really care for him, but he's not bad. He's not offensive. So he's perfectly fine. Hanneman is another one of the mean characters because of Crest! But I don't really care for his personality. He's definitely a stuck-up, high-and-mighty academic type which he, 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 it's perfect for this character, but it makes it hard for me to really like him. Alois is um, Geralt's old soldier friend, I guess. It's hard to say with, with Alois. Alois is one of those characters, and at least in the community that I hang out with when it comes to Three Houses stuff, we've developed a bit of a, of a lore around him that he actually doesn't have a wife and kids, that he just lies about it. <laughs> so in terms of like Alois himself, I don't use him in the game. I don't think, I like his voice actor a lot. I think that they did a great job. But ultimately, I don't, I don't outside of, of the lore that we've created for this, for him, I don't really have anything beyond that to say. Catherine is a Rhea stan, and to the point that it's really, really too much of her defining trait. Um, that her pride about being in the monastery and, and her love for Rhea that can never actually be fulfilled. Um, it makes her a bit of a tragic character. But I do like the way she fights, and I do like how badass she is. So it kind of offsets that a little bit, so she's not a, as much of a fail as Cyril is in terms of just like, I love Rhea as her thing. But ultimately, she's fine. Um, I just, I don't have a really strong opinion about her. Yuri is the lowest of the Ashen Wolves. I don't hate him. I don't love him. I think he's just kind of there. I do like his voice actor, and I do like some of the things that he's trying to do with the Ashen Wolves in terms of his motivations. It's... His whole thing with Bernie is weird. <laughs> um, it does ha add a bit to Bernie's background, but at the same time, it kind of cheapens it at the same time. It's just strange. It's hard to, It's hard to explain that and feel okay about it. All right, so in the B tier, or better rank, these are better than competent, uh, we have Dudu. I've actually not had much chance to interact with Dudu because I've never played Blue Lions and he's not recruitable by the other houses. But he seems like a, a, a devoted, loving man. He's from a country outside of Fodland, so that gives him some interesting perspective and background. But he's, he's just a genuinely good man, and I appreciate that about him. And maybe if I ever decide to get into the Blue Lions route in three hopes of being able to play him. Hilda. Hilda is 
borderline C, but the reason why she's here is because I love some of her voice work, but she basically manipulates everybody to do what she wants, and she's incredibly lazy, um, so she's like the lazy noble, she wants everyone to do everything for her. So the archetype I don't really like, but her voice actress just really does a lot to make her likable, and I do like the her outfits, um... She's a bold-looking character, and she swings a huge axe around, which is always a plus for me. Leone... Leone is a character that I really wish I liked more than I did. Um, when the initial, like, three houses information was coming out, I was like, Oh, Leone looks rad, but she is so much about Geralt. <laughs> and really dislikes Byleth because... She wants to be Gerald's daughter. I think that's basically it. She wants to be Gerald's daughter. She's not. So she's jealous of Byleth being Gerald's daughter. And that butting of heads when they interact is is just kind of hard to deal with after a bit in the pre-time skip. She gets better post. But it's just, it's hard. It's hard to deal with Leone early on um, because she's just so into Gerald, like that's everything she's talking about and it's like don't you have other things you could be into than just a man i don't think that leone's a bad character though i do like her um especially post skip but i just she's she's not one of the best in the game manuela is the better of the two professors um she's really funny and she's got a wonderful personality, a wonderful voice actress providing her lines. She's a hot mess. She is an absolute hot mess that just wants to have things go right and they never seem to. And despite that, she's doing her best. Just a great character. I think that, that she runs with an archetype but makes it work. And therefore she deserves to be in this tier. She's not my favorite. I don't use Manuela in my in my teams, but I think that she's a perfectly perfectly good and wonderful character and I enjoy her. Anna is not as good as Awakening Anna. It's hard to be as good as Awakening Anna <laughs> cuz just there's just a lot of things about Anna and Awakening that was done so well. But Three Houses Anna is a, a good second place. She's still all about money. She's still all about making that cash. Um, the biggest downside, I think, to Anna is that she's just really disconnected from the rest of the cast outside of Byleth, which is the same deal that happened in Awakening, but it feels even more pronounced here than it did in Awakening for some reason, probably because I love the cast of Three Houses and want everyone to interact with everyone. Balthus. Balthus is, I think, a better attempt at the the ladies man sort of archetype but he's a he's he's from a a uh, rough and tumble background he's he's like a brigand of sorts he's got that that roguish quality that works so much better than Sylvain and Lawrence's <laughs> attempts at the same type of thing i still don't really like that element of Balthus what I really like about Balthus is that he is a wrestler persona in Fire Emblem. That's really what he is. If you break him down, that's that's he's all about punching and grappling and wanting to to get in fights. And he's just an, a, he's also a very fascinating character because he is a lord, but because of life choices he's made, he's on the run. He's the oldest character in any of the houses because of this. Um, it's, it's, he's just an interesting character. So even though I kind of wish that he wasn't quite as suave, I guess, um, his other traits overpower that and make him a, a, really, a really good character. So we are now in the awesome category. And Byleth is one of the best pro tags in the series, um, in my opinion. I love female Byleth a lot. Her initial, like my initial reaction to Byleth 
was I thought her outfit was a little weird. And I still kind of feel like her outfit is a little impractical with her navel hanging out. <laughs> but I've grown to love the design. I love her teal hair too. I, I love teal, it's one of my favorite colors. So that just really won me over. And despite the fact that she doesn't speak a lot, I think that there's a lot done with her narrative that makes her really compelling. And once you get to the end and of um, Edelgard's route and you see what ignites her heart, triggers it to beat, it's amazing. Like, D has been put into a position outside of her control from birth by Rhea to be something that she never asked for and has gravely affected her interactions with people, her emotional state, because of what was done to her. And I think that seeing that, seeing her mission from the beginning of the game becoming a professor to its conclusion in, in both Golden Deer and Black Eagle's routes with Idleguard, that you just, you understand the, the depths and ramifications of Rhea's meddling with Byleth. And you feel for her, even though she doesn't emote a whole lot. She, like, the face that you see here is basically her face <laughs> that she has through almost all of the game. But despite that relative apathy that she exudes a lot of the time, she's still an incredibly well-written, well-acted character. And by the end of the game, I absolutely like fell in love with everything about her and really felt for her. So like the emotional journey of Byleth is one of the best in the series, in my opinion, for a protag. And that's why she's an awesome character. She's not one of my absolute favorites, but she is a favorite. Hubert. Hubert, I'm actually somewhat surprised in some ways that he ended up in awesome, but just based on my initial thoughts, because he's so, he's so snakish, he's so cold, he's so menacing, but voice actor killed it, made Hubert so effective, and his, this is a, this is a, an example of devotion done right. Hubert's devotion to Idleguard is so well done, and you can see the threads of how that happened in the game, and you can see how much he cares for her, and what he would do for her. It's really amazing, and he just has incredible voice work that just sells everything that he does, and you can tell how much of a strategist and tactician he is behind the scenes and how much he will how, what lengths he'll go to to win it's a really good character he's really really fun to watch Annette is a sweet bean I love Annette um, she's actually in terms of all of the post skip designs my favorite in the entire game I love the way that her colors pop in her post skip. Um, she's also one of my favorite characters to play as because she's a glass cannon of sorts. She always has kind of low HP in the two runs I've had with her, but her damage output is just off the charts. I cannot believe how much she delivers crits and like just knocks out so many things. So I love Annette. She's just such a sweet, sweet, innocent character. The biggest problem and why she's not an S is because she's just so, she's so tied to her dad. She wants to connect with her dad so bad. And her dad gives no craps about her. He doesn't want anything to do with her and it's heartbreaking. Otherwise, I think she's a wonderful character and I just absolutely adore her. She's one of my favorites to use in the game. Claude is a fantastic Lord character. He's he's basically everything that I like in a in like a, the strategist tactician style of character. 
that's got a bit of a roguish quality. He's basically a better Balthus. I think Joe did a spectacular job. I remember his name, <laughs> which is good. I don't remember every voice actor's name, unfortunately. Um, just killed the voice work with this character. I love his design, too, and it's great having a person of color as a main character. So I, I have, there's a lot to love about Claude. It's Sedith and Flan. I'm going to talk about them because they are very, very tightly knit together. They appear to be dragon kin related to Rhea, but they never show that in the game, at least in the two routes I went on. Um, Sedith is very protective. He's very cautious. He's very, very concerned about his daughter, Flane. And I think that he is a good dad <laughs> in this game, in contrast to Gilbert, the worst dad. Um, he's overprotective, of course, but he does relent and let Flan join your house. And he also allows you to interact with him more and become more trusted. He, he basically is a great example of a character that is so locked up and you help unlock a lot of his fears and a lot of his concerns and you move past them. It's a, he's a great character spotlighting healing. Flan is just a delightful character who is, she's just, she, she doesn't understand a lot of what's going on behind the scenes. So she's very innocent, I guess is a good word for it. And she loves fish. <laughs> Um, she loves Byleth, like she really connects with Byleth, and there's a reason for that. Um, she's just a sweet bean. She's a really sweet bean character, and it's just really charming to be around, and just, just fills my heart with a lot of good feels just talking to Flan. Constance. Constance is a fascinating character. Um, what I will say about Honey is that I love the fact that she is extra. There's, like, I was complaining about Yuritsa being extra because he's so moody. But in, in Connie's case, she is just a wonderfully over-the-top noble character that is hard to take seriously because she's so overzealous about it. And then you flip that, it, when she's in the sun, she loses that confidence, she loses that bravado, and she becomes incredibly meek and mild, and feels inc inc incredibly vulnerable. And I think it's a really interesting dichotomy of her character to have that split like that. So, I also love her hair. I love the fact that she has dyed the, un the, the underside of her hair purple. I think that is such a cool look, and I love her pre-time skip. I don't like her post as much, and I'm hoping if she's in Three Hopes that they find something that's a little bit in between those two. But I, I do like Connie quite a bit. The best characters in Three Houses. These are characters that I absolutely adore to pieces. There's n very little, if anything, wrong with them, in my opinion. And I am so stoked to be able to talk about them. <laughs> Idleguard is the best lord in the game. Um, she's got the coolest design. Tara Platt just nails her voice work, makes her an incredibly emotional, compelling, and engaging character to follow. Um... I think that Idleguard is one of the best characters in Fire Emblem history in terms of a, of a main character. I think that her story, her motivations, and all of everything that she does has reason, has, has a groundwork. You can understand why she's doing the things that she does. I think that Idleguard also shows incredible growth, especially on her route. She, she realizes she made mistakes and tries to do what she can to fix them. It's unfortunate that her route doesn't actually address those who slither in the dark. But she, she is a very ambitious 
woman that will not take no or failure as an option. It's She's all in. And I love that about her. And I think that's why she's such an incredibly good character. And when you get to know her, she like her 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 background is so messed up. It's 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 she's such of she she has locked herself down so much to not allow herself to heal properly. And Byleth gives her that opportunity to do that. And I think that's an incredible moment in this game when Idleguard and Byleth actually connect and and resonate and and it's Idleguard who revives Byleth's heart and it's just it's such a it's such a such a strong strong characterization Bernie Bernie is one of my favorites in the game because she has arguably the most healing that goes on for any of these characters she is she is arguably the most traumatized character um her father was very abusive um tied her up which was retconned actually because if nintendo i think decided ooh, that might be a little too much <laughs> um locked up not allowed to speak with people outside um berated all the time she is she's basically uh, just a uh, a, 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 a very she's been treated very inhumanely and and when she is at the monastery she is just incredibly isolated introverted wants nothing to do with anyone feels that anytime she talks to someone she's at fault it's she's a gut-wrenching character and her voice actress delivers such an incredible performance to make that hit hard and seeing Bernie go from where she starts to where she is with the post skip and, and is gaining confidence gaining friendships gaining trust opening her heart opening her mind opening herself up to to the world is just one of the most powerful moments in this game and it's full of powerful moments Dorothea is a theater kid. <laughs> I love theater kids because I'm a theater kid. Oh my god, she is such a delightful character. Um, it's wonderful seeing a woman, often in herself, like she knows what she wants and she's going to go get it. Dory is just she's she's a, she's got an interesting position because she's a commoner who is at this monastery, which is mostly nobles, and she is not taking any crap from anyone and she tears down these high and mighty highfalutin <laughs> princes and princesses with a keen knife just slicing them down because she's been treated so poorly um because she's just of common blood and she's just like i'm not here for it and i love her hat I think that her hat is great. I love her her post skip outfit as well. She's just a wonderful character. She's the one that I ended up pairing my Byleth with um, the first time, and I didn't have any regrets about it. Dory does have, I think, one of the more significant post skip emotional shifts as well because she definitely is a lot more um, what's the word pessimistic in the post skip I think a lot of her hopes and dreams went up in smoke when the war started and she's just not she's not here for that and I think that is a really interesting change in contrast to some of the other characters she's the one who really shows the depressive points of war of being a soldier being someone who doesn't want to be fighting but has to um, so I think she does a spectacular job at showing that side of it as well. Petra is my absolute favorite in this game. I adore Petra so much. I think that she is a wonderful addition on so many levels. I love the way that her pre-skip looks. Um, I love her hair in both. I think that she has a really interesting 
background as a princess of a foreign country basically held hostage um, for compliance from her country um, and the weight that that must be on her shoulders. Um, her political feelings um, are, are pretty out there, but she also is a foreigner trying to understand the culture, the language, and the beliefs of, of the, her oppressing country right now. And I think that her voice actress just does such a wonderful job of threading all of that complexity into a vocal performance that is my favorite in the game. And as someone who has difficulty learning other languages than English, I, I wish I didn't. I really sympathize with Petra's attempts to, to just speak with her classmates. She tries so hard to get her words out right, but you just see that second language barrier often in the pre-skip that she's just not able to just say what she wants easily. And I think that's really powerful and really connected with me because I would love to be able to speak Spanish or Japanese with fluency, but I like my brain just cannot process it. And I, I like she has to. She has to work through that. She has to be competent in speaking the language of Foglin for multiple reasons. And I think the thing about Petra that I think I love about her the most is despite all this weight, despite all of this responsibility, despite all of this pressure, she's still a very optimistic, pleasant character to be around. She she has incredible insights. She's very supportive. And she's just a lovely, lovely human being who cares and wants to liberate her country and wants to connect and make friends and and live a, a normal life, as normal as a princess can. And it's great to have another woman of color. I, I am all for more women of color, men of color, being in video games of this nature. Mercedes, I'm actually very surprised to have this high. Um, on my first playthrough, I didn't... I, I recruited her, but I didn't use her a whole lot. And it wasn't until my second playthrough where I actually connected with Mercedes and discovered how amazing a character she is. I think that one of the reasons I was a little put off by her is that she's probably the holiest of the students. She's definitely the most connected to to the uh, goddess and wanting to to be pious. But I think once the post skip happens and I actually got to explore her supports and and in my second run with Golden Deer, Byleth and, and Mercy ended up being um, the couple. Um, that really made me change my opinion on Mercy, and, and I really do like Mercy as a character a lot. I think she's got a lot going on there that, that just she hides very, very well. And she's actually an extremely hurt character that has gone through a lot of pain, but still tries her best to be a a as joyful and and grounded as she can. I, th I think Mercy's the best Blue Lion, by far. Um, as you can tell, I like the Black Eagles the most, but I think, I think that Mercy is easily the best of the Blue Lions. Um, just a wonderful character, and um, Dorothy Fawn, or yeah, Dorothy Fawn, did an incredible job with her voice. Lysynthia. Lysynthia is such a cool character in terms of how they wrote her and how she ended up coming out. Um, when you meet her, she's she seems very childish. She seems very stubborn and defiant and um, very quick to anger. And when you realize that she was experimented on by those who slither in the dark, and has two crests and is effectively feeling like her life could end at any moment 
you understand why she's the way she is and why she can be standoffish and why she can be impatient and why she's easily frustrated is because she's trying to get so much done in what she believes is so little time. And I think that, again, there's a lot of characters who, under, who have undergone a lot of trauma in Three Houses, and I think that's one of Three Houses' strengths is by not trivializing that and not being afraid of talking about that and by giving these characters the opportunity to have that trauma to carry it to, to then heal from it to learn how to get beyond it and Liz is one of those characters that I think really does a fantastic job of bringing that to the forefront of her character um, I just think that Liz is a wonderful character that that heals and goes through so much and and begins to to um, mature and allow herself to mature. I think that's the key thing there, is that she's been feeling like she's running against a clock, but when you get into the post skip and you and you talk to her more, you help her slow down and you help her allow herself to feel things that she needs to. I think it's really good. Mary Ann. Is, an, is kind of like Mercedes, where I didn't really use her in my first run, but in my second run I did. And tied with Bernie for the character who has undergone the most trauma in terms of really displaying it, she is very, very silent. She doesn't like talking to people. She doesn't want to be committed to anything because she feels like she can't do anything right. Um, she is incredibly devoted to the goddess because she feels that piety is the only thing that she has because of her crest. She has got the crest of the beast, which she is afraid will erupt at any moment and transform her into a terrible nightmare. And she has been told this by her family for years. And you can see how much it has closeted her off from the rest of the world. And Marianne is another fantastic example of a character healing. And her voice actress, again, delivers the emotion, the feeling, the growth that this character needed to be effective. And Marianne becomes so much stronger in the post-skip, even more than Bernie, I think. She... she she finds herself, and that's the key thing. Because of her crush, she never had a self. She never believed anything that she wa wanted out of her life could come to pass because at any moment she would lose it. And through the game, she, become, she gains a sense of self. She gains a sense of self-worth. And I think that's an incredibly powerful journey to go with her on. Um, she also became one of my best units on that second run as a trickster. Um, she just was an amazing fit for that role, um, being able to use swords and magic and unlock stuff. Um, she basically became the unit that I sent out ahead of everyone else because I knew she wouldn't get hurt, <laughs> and it was true. Um, just, just what a great character. Shamir! is the most interesting character in terms of the church um, group, in my opinion. Uh, she is a mercenary by trade. She's from a foreign country. She is only here because she feels like she owes Rhea a debt. But she pretty quickly deserts that and joins Byleth in her cause. And... I adore the way Shamir looks. I think she's got one of the best overall designs in the game. I love the way that she's personalized. I think that she's a really, like, blunt and take-no-crap type of character that I really like that archetype. And she's just a, a badass all the way around. And I just really adore Shamir for what she brings to the game. 
My favorite Ashen Wolf and our last character, because I've already been talking for almost an hour on this, <laughs> is Happy. Happy is, yet again, another character that has gone through so much crap to just get to this point. Um, she comes from a... She basically is an orphan um, who has been experimented on and cannot sigh without releasing a monster from some magical jail. And while the game doesn't really do much with that, it's not like she gains that ability to use it in battle or anything, um, it is a major part of why people fear her. She is a character that people fear. And I feel like her outlook on life and in the way that she just looks at things comes from a very unique perspective because of her background. Because she comes from this isolated, orphaned life where she had to leave her village at a young age, went through so much to get to where she is now, and continues to, to struggle and cannot find an easy answer to, to her to, to heal. And I think that the game does not perhaps as well of a job as it does with Bernie and with Lysynthia and Idleguard and Marianne because she's a DLC character, but does a very good job of helping her find some acceptance, some connection, some, some loosening of that fear that she has contained all her life and that she can actually feel somewhat normal, feel somewhat human. Um, I also really like the fact that she's another woman of color and I like her voice actress a lot. I think she delivers some of the best lines out of the Ashen Wolves bunch. The last thing I really like about Happy is that I never could quite figure out how to win all of her comments. <laughs> um, in Three Houses you can pick, like, a choice. And every time I thought I picked a choice that made sense to me with Happy, I was wrong. So she's hard to figure out, and I think that's something that's also kind of neat about Happy is that she doesn't go the way I would think she would go. All right, well, this is a beefy episode, but I guess it is hype month, so I'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on this journey of my Three Hopes excitement. I hope that uh, you enjoyed my thoughts on the cast and talking about the trailers and my two books as well. Uh, next week, we're going to touch on Pocky and Rocky Reshrined, which is going to be a little bit of a different style of episode. Because I'm going to be talking about Tango Project, the developer, more so than Pocky Rocky itself. But I will be covering a little bit of history on the series, as well as digging into Wild Guns Reloaded and the Ninja Warriors once again, aka the Ninja Savior's Return of the Warriors. They're two prior games that are among the best remasters of a 2D game of all time. So, I hope you will join me for that. And we've got tons of not E3 reactions going to go up this week. So I hope you'll keep an eye out for those as they pop up. The next one will be on Monday for a limited run. They're doing their annual show with Mega64. Going to reveal some of their products for the next year. Hopefully we'll figure out when Rondo of Blood's happening. <laughs> And Castlevania Advanced Collection will get announced. Those are the ones I would want, but we'll see what they have up their sleeve. So, until then, my friends, have a wonderful week, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Get that lovely ASMR action that I am so known for.